welcome, welcome everybody to today's lunchtime webinar. It's the first of two runs of this particular topic that we're doing. Harriet Carty is here from Caring for God's Acre. She's going to get you all started on how to record the beautiful species that you see in your churchyards and burial grounds, knowing your ant from your elder. Uh, we're running these two sessions in the run-up to Church's Count on Nature in June uh, to help you feel more equipped if you're, if you're thinking of running a count in your area and you're thinking, but I don't know what it is that I'll be looking at. Um, Harriet will get you started and give you pointers about why it's so important to understand what species we've got and record them and also what it is that you are looking at. Um, I always start my webinars with previews of upcoming attractions. Uh, next Monday, we've got a session on net zero carbon for schools. We've then got two briefings on the faculty rule changes that are coming up in, uh, they come into effect from July. Uh, we're running today's topic again on the 31st of May. So if you leave here today and think, oh, I do wish that my colleagues from the PCC or whoever had been there, then you'll be able to encourage them to come along to the next run. Then we hit Church's Count on Nature Week, that first full week of June. And whilst the counts are going on all around the country, uh, nationally, we're running our uh, land and nature themed webinar program. So we've got two different webinars every day at lunchtime and at four o'clock on really different and interesting aspects of land and nature. You can see them there, uh, oceans and bats, the land section of Eco Church, uh, finding our faith in trees, a really useful session. I think that's going to give people a lot of insight into the work of the church commissioners and what they're doing to manage their land for climate and nature. Uh, a session again run by Caring for God's Eco about blooming and beautiful our flower rich churchyards. We've got a session on the Nature Recovery Network featuring Tony Juniper, uh, one on using your church spaces for growing food and growing mission, then Urban Hope, which is all about creating, um, using your small spaces in, in urban settings for nature. And then we finish the week with From Global to Local, all about the joint crises of biodiversity loss and climate change. Uh, two other quick plugs, one of which is that on the 18th and 19th of May, we're offering free Zero Carbon Britain training that normally costs £75, uh, but we've commissioned a bespoke course for the Church of England and we're offering that out very widely. Um, and then in the end of June, we've got our conference on the future of heating in historic buildings. I'll put a link in the chat in a second through to our latest um, newsletter all about the webinars and events and that has all of the details and all of the booking links and I'll also put a link through to the booking page for the future of heating conference. In terms of housekeeping for today's webinar it's going to be the same as usual we'll be using the Q&A for your questions rather than the chat and you can click the thumbs up next to other people's questions to get them to rise to the top. After today, I'll be sending you Harriet's slides, any links from the chat and a link through to our feedback form. And we are recording the session and we'll make it available through our website in a few days time. Most importantly, introductions. Uh, your speaker today is Harriet Carty and you're in very, very safe and experienced hands. Harriet has a, a professional lifetime as an ecologist. And I think about the last seven years focusing on churchyards and burial grounds and she's the director of the conservation charity Caring for God's Acre. Let me stop sharing my screen so that Harriet can share hers and lead us away. Looking promising? Let me know when it's there. Come on. There we go, up and running. Great, and you can all hear me, I hope. Okay, well, very lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Catherine. Always a, always a pleasure to talk at one of your webinars. Um, knowing your aunt from your elder, I want to talk to you about biological recording, why we do it, how you can get involved, why it's important. So as Catherine said, 
I work for the conservation charity Caring for God's Acre. It's a charity dedicated to burial grounds of all types, cemeteries, chapel yards, churchyards, green burials. By far the, the bulk of the land holding is the churchyards of England and Wales and also the urban cemeteries. They're fantastic places for built heritage. They're fascinating places for local history. And they're also really surprisingly good places for biodiversity and for wildlife, as well as being very important green spaces. Um, I think we all discovered that in lockdown, didn't we? A lot of people found, found little nooks and crannies and churchyards and cemeteries during lockdown when um, they couldn't travel very far. So churchyards in particular, but cemeteries as well, are, are really very good for biodiversity. And it's to do with the amount of time that they've been in existence, the time that they've been managed in a very consistent way. Um, it can be for decades, centuries, and occasionally for millennia. So quite unusual spaces in our very busy, changing country. And we do know quite a bit about them. I'm going to tell you the things I do know, and then I'm going to tell you the things I don't know. So to start with, I know that we have in Britain a globally important population of ancient and veteran ewes. They're by far, by far our oldest trees. Um, the oldest ones are of no known age. I mean, it's always quite difficult to age trees and may well predate Christianity. We know that there are about 800 of these fantastic trees um, in Britain, of which three quarters are in English and Welsh churchyards. So if, if you're one of the people looking after one of them, thank you very much. It's a very, very special thing. So we know about our yew trees. We also know about our lichens. Quite indistinguished, not 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 terribly not terribly sort of dramatic or special, but these little grey and yellow and brown blobs on and white blobs on um, stones and trees are really important. And again, churchyards are brilliant for them. There are about two thousand species of lichen um, in Britain, and over seven hundred of them have been found in churchyards, so about a third. And half of those, half of those are rare or sometimes never been found anywhere else. So again, we know that churchyards are really very important for lichens. Now, the reason that we know that, the reason that I can give you those two, two facts about those two completely different um, species or groups, is because people have been making biological records. So the ancient yew group have been recording, photographing, measuring yew trees, the length and breadth of the country, and have an amazing database, which if it doesn't contain all of them, they're not adding many new ones to it. So it's, it, I think it does contain them all. And if not, I'm sure they're very excited when a new one is found. The ancient tree inventory, which is run by the Woodland Trust, um, draws both on the ancient new groups data and other people's data and encourages people to go out and record other species of ancient tree. And the British Lichen Society have, have been surveying all over the place and have particularly focused on churchyards and have a data set of churchyard lichens because they know how important they are. And I think a key thing to say is that most of those people who are out recording are not doing it as part of their day job they're doing it as volunteers. There are some people employed um, within the biological recording community, so the people running the ancient tree inventory within the Woodland Trust, for example, but most of it is a voluntary effort. It really is citizen science long before that, that phrase was coined. And when somebody makes a biological record, be they an expert such as a, a you know a well experienced member of the British Lichen Society or a beginner who's just having a first go, um, that their, their, that information that they provide will feed through to a national system. It'll go through a system of checking. Checks and balances exist, so we're we're confident of the quality of the biological record. Uh, there are a whole group of volunteers, again, verifiers, who will check other people's records 
and look at them and perhaps get in touch and go, you know, you said you saw such and such. Well, there's a that's very, very rare and never been found in this locality. And there's another species that looks really similar. Do you think do you think it could be that one? They'll try and support and help people in their learning journey to 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 become naturalists. And it's quite a special thing in Britain to have this sort of network of naturalists and to rely on volunteers to provide information for the biological record. Some other countries, it's it's only done by professionals. So, so a very special thing. And I hope you're thinking, well, maybe that's something that I can join in with, because indeed it is. So that actually brings me to nearly the end of what I absolutely know for definite, what I have data for um, about the biodiversity of churchyards. I have some data for, for a whole lot of other things and I can make educated guesses as to how good they are for biodiversity. So churchyard walls, for example, I know that they're really good. The churchyard wall is usually as old as the, the, the churchyard, which is often Saxon, maybe Norman, Victorian. That wall will have been building up a rich array of ferns, mosses, plants, spiders, other invertebrates, small birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles. So I know that there's an awful lot of biodiversity in that churchyard wall. The grassland, the grassland will be um, old meadowlands. Um, we've lost 90% of our, 97% of our meadowland in the last 60 years and churchyards on the whole contain that very precious habitat. So that'll be full of flower, flowering plants, different native grasses, lichens again, mosses, fungi, liverworts, a whole host of invertebrates within the soil. There are all sorts of small mammals, amphibians, reptiles and birds feeding within the grassland, particularly if the grass is, is allowed to grow long. So again, I know it's very good for biodiversity, but I lack the data. Come the autumn, you could get fantastic shows of fungi in churchyards. Again, that's another feature of both, of both the trees within them and also the grassland. Um, you can get all sorts of wax caps, spindles and earth stars. When people look in churchyards for amphibians and reptiles, they invariably find them. And we have volunteer groups going out doing practical conservation tasks, and they often, often find slow worms. So we know they're very good for amphibians and reptiles. Um, frogs, toads and newts, for most of the year, they're not in ponds and they're very, very often in churchyards and cemeteries. And lots of the species that might have been called common or garden a while ago. Species that we find in our own gardens um, often use the churchyard. They might be nesting in the churchyard, they might be overwintering in it, they might be feeding in it, and then they're coming out into our gardens and we're seeing them. So it's a really sort of important stronghold of garden species as well. So Again, I'm making educated guesses. I lack the data and I would really like to know more about what actually has been found within churchyards. And not only I would like to know, um, much more influential and important people would like to know. The Church of England would like to know. The Church in Wales would like to know. They want to know how good their land holding is for biodiversity. Natural England and Natural Resources Wales, the government agencies, would like to know for the Nature Recovery Network, where we feel that burial grounds may have a really important role to play. We all want to know what's out there. This slide comes from the Church Heritage Records of England and Wales. For those of you who've applied for a faculty relatively recently, you might be familiar with this, this particular um, website. And each of those crosses marks a burial ground. And we estimate that if you put them all together they cover the area of about equivalent to the Isle of Wight so it's a significant land holding and there's definitely over 20,000 of them in England and Wales so an awful lot of these little sites and so we'd like to know what's in every single one of them and we'd like to know what what cumulatively they're all holding in terms of habitats and I think when you see this slide you can get both a picture of little hubs, little little spots of hot spots of biodiversity within that nature network of verges and hedges and meadows and gardens. And I think also 
I like to think of them as sort of cafes for uh, little pit stops for species on the move, either migrating or needing to move in the face of climate, climate change. It's, it's a very important resource. So as well as biodiversity in its own right, we're really starting to try and find out a bit more about how good churchyards are and other burial grounds are for carbon storage. Uh, we don't yet know, and um, Catherine and I actually, we've got a meeting about it this afternoon, haven't we, Catherine? But we're, we, we do know quite a bit, and again, we, we're finding out more. So we do know that mature soils store far more carbon than ones that have been disturbed. And you don't get much more mature a soil than a Saxon churchyard. So they've developed a whole network of roots, of fungal mycorrhizae, of bacteria, of um, all sorts of invertebrates. It's a, it's a complex web and it's got a lot of carbon embedded within it. We know that grasslands, grasslands can store about as much carbon as forests. They just store much more underground rather than visibly overground. And we know that when they're species rich and diverse and again mature, they store more. We know that long grass, particularly species rich, stores more than short grass. And of course, we also know that trees store it. Young trees are locking it away quicker because they're growing fast, but older trees have held that carbon tight for a long time. So as well as really important for biodiversity and linked with it, we think, that churchyards are going to be important carbon stores. So we've been running a project for four years now called the Beautiful Burial Ground. And um, we work with another partner, the um, National Biodiversity Network, who store biological records and make them readily available to everybody through the NBN Atlas. And the NBN have created a sort of, it's, like, it's sort of like a skin, a sort of page within their atlas where you can see what species have been recorded in burial grounds. They've done that in partnership with ourselves. Church of England staff and also Church in Wales staff did a fantastic job mapping all of these sites. And so now you can look on this atlas, you or anybody else can look on the atlas and see what wildlife has actually been recorded within the churchyard or a cemetery near you. The little inset box there is, um, I just thought I'd have a look at Canterbury Cathedral and it shows you how the system works. The white dots there, there were every, every round circle is a burial ground and the white dots are burial grounds on which we have no records. Doesn't mean that nobody knows what's there, it means they haven't submitted it as a record into the system. Pale green dots, I don't know if you can just make out, there's sort of several shades of green there. Pale green dots have between um, one and 10 records, mid green, 10 to 100, and the dark green is over 100. And interestingly, Canterbury Cathedral, which is one of the dark greens in there, has 160 species, which I thought was rather a lot for a cathedral, considering they, they're often quite manicured. They're mainly lichens, mosses, grassland plants, and also quite a few birds. If you were to click on one of those dots, and I've, I've chosen an ex a different example, not Canterbury Cathedral here. If you were to click on one of those dots, it opens up and tells you exactly what has been found. So this, this site in Painswick I chose because um, you can see it's got 63 different species have been recorded. So you think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what's there. And then you're slightly, um, you, you find yourself looking and you've got a lot, of, a lot of Latin there, a lot of Latin there and a snail. And what you've got there is you've got the list from whoever surveyed it for the British Lichen Society. And lichens tend to not have English names, so it's just solid lichen. We don't have solid Latin. We don't have any other records for that particular site. And it would be lovely to have some of the more common species. Um, has it got a holly tree? Has it got a yew tree? Has anyone seen a robin? What about a magpie? There's a molehill there. So when doing biological recording, the common is the species are the ones that are often overlooked. 
it's said that there's more records of otters than there are of rats, because nobody ever makes a biological record of a rat, whereas every otter gets, gets put into the record. So please don't feel that if you're not an expert, this isn't for you. We really, really want to know the common species as well as the rare. Sometimes when I give talks, I think I've got all these beautiful slides from rural Shropshire, where Karen for God's Acre is based. We're in the rolling Shropshire hills, an area of outstanding natural beauty. We've got lots of lovely rural churchyards and, and, and flowing grasses and flowery places. And people who live in very different places or very urban places might be thinking, well, that's all very nice, but what about us? So I just thought I'd give you a few examples from around the country. This is um, a churchyard local to, to us in Shropshire, St Mary in Bromfield. And so it does fall into that category of very beautiful and very rural. And there are 165 species here, including dormice. This, however, is a very different churchyard. St Michael's in Litchfield is extremely central to Litchfield. There's a big, busy old road running just, just around the side of it. And it's actually a closed churchyard managed by the council who mow it rather ferociously. It is an old churchyard, which would make you think the church, parts of the church are 13th century. So that might make you think, well, it's quite likely to have a lot of species. And it's also very large. We've run a BioBlitz in St Michael's and also a very good ecologist lives nearby. He's done quite a bit of recording and there's been over a thousand species recorded from this one very urban churchyard with short grass mowed by the council. So I hope that's giving you an idea that it's not just the rural. It is a rural site, but it's a site in very, very rich agricultural land. Um, St John the Evangelist in Sharrow is near to Ripon and just over the churchyard wall is, is arable fields all around with that really strong dark green colour that you associate with intensive farming and a lot of nitrates and it's an absolute oasis of um, biodiversity and flowers within, within that real farming landscape. And my last example, a couple of cemeteries. Um, these are both from the 1860s. Our cemeteries tend to be Victorian because that's the point when the churchyards became full. The cemeteries were created on what was then the edges of towns and cities, and now they're pretty central. The um, bottom of the two pictures is Shrewsbury Cemetery. Uh, we know that Shrewsbury Cemetery, so far we've recorded 361 species within it. And that includes 15 different species of bees. So really important for our native pollinators. The other slide is from Tower Hamlets in the east end of London, an extremely urban and built up area. There's 188 species um, so far recorded within Tower Hamlets Cemetery. And this is, a, this is a site that went through the Blitz, large areas of it were bombed. Um, it, became neglected for a long time and went to woodland. So it's had a really checkered history and it's still full, full, full of biodiversity. So I've told you about databases and shown you maps and told you we want the data for scientific reasons and for carbon storage. But I think the other really important thing to say about, about um, recording species and getting involved with it is it's really very, very good fun and is quite addictive and is excellent for family um, activities. So as I hope all of you know, um, Church's Count on Nature is happening again in 2022. We had our first year last year and it was very well received. So we're delighted to be doing it again. Um, and we're asking you to record biodiversity during Love Your Burial Ground Week, which is the 4th to the 12th of June. And it doesn't matter what you do, whether it's a couple of friends looking for a few birds or whether it's a whole week of events. It's completely up to you what you do. But we would like you to spot some wildlife and let us know about it. For those of you who did it last year in 2021, please have another go. Please join in again. And for those of you who are considering having a go for the first time, 
have a look on our website. We've got a lot of information there. We've got frequently asked questions. We've got some resources. And we've also got this map um, showing you all the sites that got involved last year, where we had about 540 sites involved last year. And if you click on one of these stars, it'll open up and tell you what somebody did last year. So that can give you some ideas, a bit of inspiration. I chose uh, the site the furthest down the toe of Cornwall just to have a little look and um, it sounded absolutely lovely. I hope they're going to do it again. The church hub will be open every day, dawn to dusk. We invite people to come and add to the chart of nature they observe. There'll be a launch with an outdoor service on June the 6th and a coffee morning on June the 9th. So sounds like absolutely lovely event. Sounds like uh, obviously it took a bit of organising, but not not too onerous and I hope they hope they enjoyed themselves and do it again next year but if you click around on that map you'll see all sorts of people did all sorts of different things and hopefully get some ideas so what does it actually involve making a biological record well there's four w's the first is who who's making the record if there's a group of you making the record we do need one of you to sort of step forward and put your name on it you can't put a group up I'm afraid and that's because those verifiers may want to get back in touch with you and ask you a little bit more detail about what you saw what you saw tell us the common or the scientific name just basically tell us the level of detail that you're comfortable with that you know where you are we need your name and address and postcode grid reference is helpful we just need to be able to definitely pinpoint that record into whichever churchyard it occurred and when um, the date rather than the time of day so it's as simple as that you make up a list you can either email it to us this is a page from our website again so if anyone's scribbling it down don't worry it's on our website also Catherine's going to share the slides uh, email it to us you can pop something in the post if if you prefer um, or you can add them to an online system called iNaturalist. Now, this is the first year we're encouraging people to use iNaturalist because although it did exist last year, it didn't link into the biological record. So it does now and it's quite good fun. Again, this is a slide from our, our website and you'll see that on our website, if you get into the Get Involved tab, you can find a bit about using iNaturalist and watch a little video that will explain how to how to get going with it. It's an app that you download to a, a smartphone or to a tablet or a laptop. Here's me playing about with my um, phone with iNaturalist. I went out and I took a photo. It encourages you to take photos rather than just writing what you see, but you can write as well. And then it gives you some helpful ideas what you might be seeing. So it's really a jolly helpful little tool. So I took this photo of this fern. It then offered me two possibilities, both of which are actually more or less the same. It said, is it a spleenwort or is it heart's tongue fern? Now heart's tongue fern is a kind of spleenwort. So I then clicked on heart's tongue fern and you'll see from the red arrow, there it is appearing in on my phone as my observations um, that have gone up onto iNaturalist. So it's pretty easy to use. Um, it takes out quite a bit of the identification for people who, who want a bit of help with that. And it is particularly good fun for people who enjoy messing about with a tablet on phone, which is often the young, though not always. To get involved with Churches Council Nature, we ask you to register on our website. And one of the things we ask you is whether you'd like some, um, some hard copy resources sending out, because obviously not everybody wants to be peering at a phone and not everybody wants to be working on a tablet. So uh, it, it's always a good idea to bring along some things like bird books or any flower books you might have. And we're, we're sending out a couple of copies of the starter guide that you see illustrated there. And also a Field Studies Council um, fold out chart on burial grounds that we, we created with the Field Studies Council a few years ago. Here's just a few pages from um, that uh, starter guide. And you'll see there he is again, heart's tongue fern on the section on wall plants. So it just gives you some ideas what you might be looking at.
I, I'd like to challenge people to create, to, to sort of help and foster the entomological nerds of future. I love this slide because that little boy crawling about on the ground there looks so like that chap peering into his butterfly net at some very obscure micro moth 20 years later. So please, please run an activity, try and encourage the young to get involved and also get those nerds out, get those, get those serious entomological nerds out and see if they'll come and set up a moth trap and um, peer at things in little tubes like that. So we started with your ant from your elder. Well, I hope I hope you you know the difference between an ant and an elder bush. If you don't, I naturalist will help you with that. I don't think it could quite tell you which ant you were looking at in case, unless you took a fantastically good photograph, because um, there are twenty two thousand different um, ants across the globe. We've got only 51 species in, in the UK that are native, though that's still rather a lot out of 11 genera. But I'm just giving you this one top tip. So if you have a churchyard that contains ant hills, you've probably been cursing them as you try and mow around them. Well, try and look at them in a new light because um, ant hills are built by the yellow meadow ant. And so if you've got anthills, you immediately know you've got that particular species. So you can make a biological record immediately. They're also an indicator of this lovely old undisturbed meadowland. So something quite special. Thank you very much. And that's all from me, which will hopefully leave us quite a bit of time for some questions. Thank you so much, Harriet. I love when you do your webinars the photographs you share it's just so lovely it's so beautiful to sit and look at them so everyone wake up now stop me. <laughs> do you want to stop sharing your screen so that people can see you a, a little bit bigger uh, so please do if you've got questions pop them in the q a we've got one question there that actually links to something in the chat as well so let's start with that it's about iNaturalist mm -hmm. um and uh, in the chat, we've been asked, is there a specific project registered on iNaturalist for Churches Count on Nature? And then I think that's similar to what's in the Q&A, which is somebody who's downloaded iNaturalist and they can only see Churches Count on Nature from 2021. Will there be a new project for 2022? Tell us more about that. There, is, there isn't a, I don't know what you've looked at to find a Churches Council on Nature and I Naturalist, because I didn't think there was a project for it in 2021, but maybe I'm not the data person, so I could be wrong. But there absolutely is one now. It's called the Beautiful Burial Ground. Ah, oh, so people it, need to look for Beautiful Burial Ground rather than Churches Count on Nature. Yes, as a project, as a project. If you're not familiar with I Naturalist, and this is all sounding a bit gobbledygook, have a look on our website and have a look at the little video there where my colleague Liam, who's our data manager, will show you how to register onto iNaturalist and register a project and then get going doing the record. Yeah, Beautiful Burial Ground is the project. That makes sense. We've used that. Uh, whilst we wait for other people to pop their questions in, I'd, you mentioned there about getting out the, uh, the nerds. <laughs> um, I would imagine that most people listening to this would feel like, OK, I can do the robins, I can do the daisies, probably a bit wider than that. When we're getting into your lichens and your insects and stuff, are there local partner organisations that the parish might be able to reach out to and invite them to come to the Count on Nature to bring those more specialist areas? There certainly are. There certainly are. I mean, for lichens, the British Lichen Society is 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 the group to go to. They're thinly spread, so I'm not. They may not be able to come, but they're real, real enthusiasts, and they're a pleasure to be with. Um, there's butterfly conservation. Um, we'll cover butterflies and moths. Far, far, far more moths than there are butterflies. Um, possibly run a moth trap, particularly if you perhaps can offer them some breakfast or make a donation to butterfly conservation or you know somehow you know be particularly welcoming to them um 
what what's a very useful thing is to just try and get an all-round naturalist often a botanist can do an awful lot of other things because if you get say an entomologist and it's a cold day you you'll, you'll find you know you can rootle around looking for some dead wood and things like that but you won't see much flying you know you won't you, won't, you, you know you, you're going to see a lot of a lot of wood lice uh, really so getting a sort of a bit of an all-rounder is a good idea contacting your local wildlife trust is a really good idea and saying if you've got any keen volunteers who might be interested in doing this um, as a donation to the wildlife trust or just for fun and in which case can you just send them a message and they can get in touch with us if, if they want to know and also one of the partners involved in churches count on nature arosha they do have some naturalists who've offered to come out and help some people with some of their counts so it's always worth asking arosha particularly if you're an eco church but i think anyone could ask them i'm sure they'd be delighted to hear from everybody and just saying have you got a naturalist nearby who'd like to come and get involved with with our count I'd really like to encourage people to do no mo man. Oh, Harriet has frozen for me. Oh, frozen and disappeared. But now, oh, you're back. You, you're you've come back on mute. You were just saying I'd encourage people to take part in no mo may. At which point yeah. you froze and disappeared. <laughs> I'd really like to encourage people to do no mo may in part of their churchyard at least and then just hang on in there until after that second week of of June till after churches count on nature and really let 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 the grassland grow up and see what's in it and see what flowers come through and also what invertebrates can be found what what, what you can see using that grassland you don't have to do it over the whole churchyard um, that probably wouldn't be appropriate anyway find find a place that was look was short grass and let it grow long for a little while and see what comes up and that makes the whole thing much more fun really and much more interesting for a visiting naturalist who would be a bit despondent if they came along the whole thing was mown very short right the questions have started flooding in very good um the first question is from sarah that says can we start observing and counting now to which i assume you are yes please please do please do um the idea of love your burial ground week and churches count on nature and doing something in june it it is for fun really it's to focus the mind it's a lovely time of year to be out and recording but we'd love you to be out recording every day of, every day of the year if you fancied you know the more the better the bigger and better the picture we can get of the biodiversity of burial grounds the more informed we are the more we can influence decision making <laughs> we can all really champion these fantastic places and different species will be spotted at different times of year so mm. the, the more weeks of the year you can record something the better yeah i mean one really lovely time of year to go out is when the yew berries are, are, are on the yew trees and the winter thrushes are just coming in you can sometimes see sun thrush missile thrush field fair red wing all yelling and dropping berries all over the ground and making a right mess and having a great time so that's a particularly lovely time to be in the churchyard looking at looking at wildlife so here, here's a really good question from claire as someone totally new to this how do you suggest we start practically with a family who turn up knowing very little would tick sheets be a good idea or is it better to just let families loose record anything they see that is a very nice question yeah um I think you could you could perhaps start by helping them to record something really easy. I mean, a molehill is a good one. You know, if you've got a molehill, you've had a mole. A squirrel, that can be a nice one. Sometimes, you know, a jackdaw, a magpie, something like that. Point out something they know. Do they do they know a prickly holly bush? And then you go, well, there you are. You've made a biological record and off you go they could perhaps make a collection of leaves and bring it back to you and um, you could then have a look and see if you could help them sort of do a bit of leaf bingo that starter guide that i showed that we're we're sending out a couple of couple of copies to anyone who asks and also the field studies council chart that has some common species that you're likely to see um, in it that those both of those are aimed at getting people going at the beginning We've also got some other resources up on our website. Um, I mean, that leaf bingo is one. We've got silhouettes of different leaves that from trees you're quite likely to find in the churchyard and people can pick leaves and then come back and 
try and match them against the silhouette. So, so yeah, I, I think probably start them off with something, let them loose and then, you know, get them to come back with what they find perhaps. And you have on your website a whole um, children's pack, don't you? We do, we do. We have an education pack and we've got a sort of discovery pack of, you know, activities to do in church hours. The education pack um, is slightly more aimed at teachers, but there's a lot of a lot of stuff that overlaps into messy church, into Cubs, Scouts, Brownies and, um, and just family family days out, really. Yeah. Uh, next question from Linda. Do all my participants put their finding into iNaturalist or do I have to enter all their findings? That is up to you, but I tell you, if you can get them to do it and them to find that fun and do it themselves, you've saved yourself quite a bit of work. Um, but often people end up with, say, a blackboard where people write down what they've seen, in which case then one person does need to put it into our naturalist or, or type it up and, and send it, you know, email it to us if putting it into our naturalist feels like a chore and that isn't a, a, a thing that, for some people it feels a very easy thing to do if they're very used to using laptops and tablets and apps and things like that. Other people it just feels like an absolute chore and they'd much rather just make a list. But having a blackboard or a flip chart up and asking people to just write down what they see is 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 good fun too. If, if they're all going around with it, it does it matter if the same thing gets recorded multiple times? It doesn't really. It doesn't really. I mean, you know, it could be that the same thing would be recorded on subsequent days. You know, plants don't move around. Lots of things are recorded a lot of times, particularly on nature reserves. I mean, if you are doing an organised activity, you might, you know, for people who aren't putting out their own records, you might try and end up with a central list and just submit one. But if people are making their own records, that, that's that's fine. Okay. Uh, our church doesn't have a burial ground. Are we still OK to log in the beautiful burial grounds project? So if they've got a green space that's not a burial ground, what do they do? Yeah, log in, log in. I think that will work. Um, what it might not do is it 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 might not end up on exactly the same part of the NBN Atlas, but I don't think many people, you know, you're not going to mind that probably, are you? You can still have a very fun day out, still use iNaturalist, still log into the project, still, you know, contribute important data. Uh, if we invite people to count during the whole week, would there be some doubling up of observations? So again, I think that's sort of the same point as above, which is don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, a question from Helen. We had a complaint by a family last year that there was not something like a worksheet for children. Is there anything suitable we could use? So I'm just was about to put the link to the education pack in there. Um, is there a particular sheet that springs to mind that you would point people towards? Um, we did, I think in the in this sort of Churches Council Nature section on our website, we did we did fish some bits of the education pack out that we thought would go well. Leaf leaf bingo was was one of them. Um, another thing that isn't actually about biological recording, but is quite fun for families, is a symbol scavenger hunt. You go around looking for different symbols on monuments. That can that can that can keep them going when they've scurried around and gone. That's it. I found a squirrel. I want to go home now. You go, well, come on, go and have a look for all these symbols as well. Um, so there are quite a few worksheets there. And we've also got some other other newer resources that we've pulled out of the education pack and put together. I'm just looking for the link. So I found the Burial Ground Discovery Pack and the Education Pack. Are those the ones? Great. Uh, let me just get those in the chat. Um, please have a look in the frequently asked questions in the Churches Council Nature section because we've got some links in there as well and you know there's, there's quite a bit in there that hopefully will be helpful. And then Sarah says how do we ask for a starter guide? You register when you register for Churches Council Nature you register your activity um, there's a there's a tick box to say would you like would you like a starter guide sending out you get two starter guides and one field studies council chart is what we're sending out this year do you want to just since since you've touched on it just explain to people how they register if they're if they're thinking this is something they want to do what kind of information will they need to give you when they register so uh, 
hopefully not too onerous. Um, what we're asking you to do is have your activity quite well planned. So you, you register in one go. Last year, we did a two stage process. I don't, people might remember if they did it last year. That was because it was COVID. So we asked people to just give an expression of interest when we were pretty much locked down still and we didn't know how, how difficult it would be to run an event. And then nearer the time to register and telling us exactly what they were gonna do. This year, we're just doing just doing one registration process because obviously we're in a different situation now. Um, and we really just want to know who you are, contact details. Um, we asked you which ones you're happy to share, whether you're happy for them to be shared on our website or not and what you're going to do oh have you lost me again no you haven't no no i realized i could share my screen and then people could see it so kim for god's sake get involved event register which is pretty obvious if you go onto the kim for god's sake site and then sorry i didn't mean to interrupt your flow i was just finding no, that's that's right. so I was see. Assuming I, my internet had blipped but no it hadn't yeah so it's their details name or title of their event name the church burial ground address County postcode, description of activity. So what kind of level of detail would you be expecting in there, do you think? So that's where that example that I had from Cornwall had said, we'll, we'll, we'll be open all week with a, with a chart for people to put their records on. And we're also holding an outdoor service and a coffee morning. It's that sort of, sort of level, you know, it, this is what will appear on the website. So if you know what date you're gonna be doing something, you know, please put the date in and, just a description it might be family drop in to see what you can see or it might be something like a coffee morning or 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 perhaps you've got a visiting naturalist and there'll be you know two hours with so and so from the wildlife trust you know um seeing you know learning a bit more about identification or people opening up a moth trap from 8 a.m come and join in and then we'll all have breakfast but it's that sort of level of detail dates times and um you know at publicity level and then are they an eco church their diocese if that's applicable when it's happening the uh, web yeah. address but that's not compulsory is it so that's if they're listing it online they can give it to you a photo and then this is the answer to Sarah's question isn't it which is um if people want the starter guide and a guide to wildlife they give their information in there and then you will send them the starter guide we will. We're sending them out in two tranches. One's going out fairly soon and then another one towards the end of another sort of batch towards the end of May. And then we do need people to to um, have done a risk assessment. But there's some advice and help on how to do that. But we need, we need people to do their own risk assessments and take that they have those in place. Very good. So hopefully it's hopefully it's quite easy. Um, quite a few people are managing to register it. We haven't had too many people phoning up going help. I don't know what to put. So hopefully it's, it's it'll work for you as well and you'll find it quite easy to register. Now we've finished all of the questions that have come in so far. So I'll just waffle for a few seconds to see if any more questions come in. And if they don't, then we might just say, thank you so much, Harriet, for sharing your beautiful photographs and, and very useful information about how to go about doing things with us today. Um, I will save the chat so that we've got all of the links. Um, and later today, I'll send everyone, ah, another one has popped in. Uh, don't, that's absolutely fine. We had a few minutes left. If we had to do it a week later, would it matter? wouldn't matter it wouldn't it wouldn't be love your burial ground week it wouldn't be quite the same but we would just love to have your records whenever it works for you will it still get listed or, or will it sort of will the registration process not accept dates outside of the range well, it might not get listed i'm afraid it might not get listed because that 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 map is specifically for things happening during that week but it would still be equally as good an event and equally as valuable data. Because people, I guess that's the kind of almost the main message, isn't it? Which is please record mm. all year round, but there's a special focus during Church's Count on Nature that you know people will be doing it in that week all around the country. Yeah. We've but the records are still just as useful at any time. 
It is just as useful at any time. We have tried to make it sort of as easy as possible for people by putting in two weekends. So, you know, if there's a wedding one weekend, hopefully you've got another weekend where you might be able to run something. But we do appreciate that no no one week, even with double weekends, is going to work for everybody. Right. I have saved the chat. Um, everyone who's joined today, thank you so much for coming along. I do hope that you'll register uh, a church's count on nature event um, and I'll be sending you the slides and all of the links the recording will be on our website in a few days and also as I said at the beginning we're running it again at the end of May so if you think that someone else um, would value please do share it with them. Can I just add, add something in Catherine which yeah. is um Last year, we had quite a few vicars sort of saying, I'll be running events in all of my 10 churches or something like that. It's like, hooray, well done, fantastic, good for you. It, 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 you can register like that if you like, or you can register each separately. A bit of irritating paperwork, but then we could send you out starter guides, you know, we could send you out starter guides for each of the different churches to have them and to maybe keep them at the back of the church for anyone who pops in and wants to have a look. So, so find out what works best for you but if you are running things in different locations you want to register twice and, and, and get two 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 little goodie bags that's fine by us i had nearly finished but such an interesting question has come in that i will sneak it in it's about historical records if people have got historical records that people have written down in the past can those be uploaded as well and is that useful yes provided they have those four w's who what where when yes they can they can indeed there's such a wealth of information in people's notebooks you know and tucked away under the backs of cupboards and things like that we love we'd love to hear some more about what people have found in the past um and also quite often records have been submitted to say the botanical society or to um, a local record center and some of those have migrated through to the MBN and some of them haven't. So we'd like to have them again, you know, if, if, if even if they've gone into a system, we would be interested in seeing them again. And we would liaise with whoever they'd been sent to. We wouldn't just simply put them up as if they were new records as a duplicate, but we'd love to get them pinpointed to the churchyard. You'd like all of the records you can get, wouldn't you? We jolly well would. We jolly well would. That's just what we'd like. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Harriet. That has been a really helpful webinar. Um, yeah, I hope you all go out and plan an event. Um, and I look forward to seeing all those registrations of Churches Count on Nature events binging into the system. Uh, thank you all for coming and goodbye.